thank you very much, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I'm one of the two uh, pituitary surgeons here at Queen's Square. Uh, we have a, 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 a long history of pituitary surgery here, um, and I have learned huge amounts from my immediate predecessor, Mick Powell, who many of you may well know from his fundraising efforts for the, for the, um, the National Brain Appeal. Um, but I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about where pituitary surgery is now, where it's perhaps going. Um, but to start with, where is the pituitary gland and what does it do? So the pituitary gland sits just behind uh, the back of your nose, effectively, at the back of your sinuses. So that area there is the sinus and your pituitary gland sits just behind that. And that's something that we exploit in terms of trying to find the least invasive way of getting to problems in that area. For something that is the size of a pea, it's actually incredibly important. It controls huge numbers of our general bodily functions. So it controls our thyroid gland, it controls our general get up and go, it controls our blood pressure by controlling our adrenal glands, it controls our fluid balance, and it also um, controls our reproductive organs particularly. So as I say, for something that is tiny, it, it is incredibly important, but it can also cause us quite a lot of problems. Thankfully, the vast majority of what goes wrong with a pituitary gland is, is benign. Pituitary tumours or adenomas are benign pituitary tumours. And as I say, that's 95% of what we see in that area. There are other things that can go wrong with the pituitary gland. So there are things like infections, uh, granulomas or, or inflammatory responses in that area. But there are also an awful lot of other things in that area that can cause problems. So they're not directly related to the pituitary gland, but they sit very much in the remit of the, the pituitary surgeon's um, sort of uh, patient population, if you like. So we, we see a lot of abnormalities that come from things that develop into our pituitary gland, which can cause tumours called craniopharyngiomas and case cleft cysts. And we see lots of other types of tumours, um, meningiomas, which, which grow from the meninges or the coverings of the brain, um, and other, other tumours in that area. And these are just a selection of, of um, different abnormalities that you can get in that, in that area. We've known about the pituitary gland for a very, very long time. The ancient Egyptians, about 2,000 years BC, first um, acknowledged the fact that there was a pituitary gland and that it can cause problems with our hormones. Um, and they also, I think, used it as an approach to, to mummify bodies. But you'll be glad to know that, that things have moved on somewhat since then. Um, the, the first operation, transcranial operation, so through the head, done for a uh, pituitary uh, problem was done in uh, 1889 by Victor Horsley, who is very closely affiliated with Queen Square and particularly the neurosurgical department. He's regarded very much as the, the father or the grandfather of neurosurgery within the UK and was appointed as the first uh, UK neurosurgeon here at the National Hospital. Um, so our, our neurosurgical department is named after him as is one of our wards. The first transphenoidal operation, so as I, as I said to you earlier, it, it, exploiting that route through the nose, through the sinuses, was undertaken in the early 1900s. And you can imagine that trying to get at that through the back of the nose avoids having to go through the head and all the complications associated with that. And particularly in this, in this era, era when we were worrying about infection and anaesthesia, anything that you could try and make safer was, was clearly in advance. And since then, <coughs> further advances have, have been accredited really to Harvey Cushing um, and Norman Dott, who was a Scottish neurosurgeon, and Gerard Guillot. And the, the real advances in terms of pituitary surgery have been about how we approach, um, a, approach pituitary um, problems. So as I say, historically, we've always approached them through the head, so transcranial. People need um, a much bigger procedure. You're exposing the brain, obviously, to even get to where you need to get to, which is at the back of the nose, effectively. Or the transphenoidal approach, 
as I say, through the nose into the air sinus to the pituitary gland. And you can see that this pituitary gland and this bright white dot, which is actually a normal point on the scan in the posterior pituitary, is a direct route in without having to go past any of the brain and avoiding anything, any sort of trauma in that regard. There are clear reasons that we, we operate through the head, but if we can try and get at things through the nose, then as I say, patients tend to prefer it. I can't think why. Um, and, and it is generally safer. People recover from it much more quickly. Um, and as I say, it's generally a, generally a better option. So how do we make our decisions now? I mean, historically, it's really been about what we have thought the underlying pathology was. Um, and that's, been, that's allowed us to have some idea of the consistency of what we're trying to take out. Most pituitary tumours are actually very, very soft. So you can, actually, you can take out seemingly really quite large abnormalities through a very small hole. If you're trying to take out something much tougher um, and you're not able to, to, to see round corners and things like that, obviously that makes you start to think about whether you should be operating through somebody's head rather than through their nose. We also want to know where the, where the nerves to the eyes are. The chiasm is, is, the, is the area of the, the optic nerves. They come out of the back of your eyes and then cross over just above the pituitary gland. And this is looking at, looking at you from the front. This is the pituitary gland. This is the air sinus. And that white line there are the nerves to your eyes. And these aren't affected yet, but most pituitary tumours will start to cause those nerves to be pushed up. And that's often how people present. So that has an impact on our decisions. Whether the pituitary fossa is big or not, if, if, if you've had a benign tumour sitting there for a very long time, the, the, the pituitary fossa, the little bony depression where the pituitary gland sits often gets bigger. And that means that it, we've got a larger route into to, to bigger things. So as I say, if it's expanded or enlarged, that can help us. And also where the, where the neck of the abnormality is. Things are often a bit hourglass. And if we've got a big lump above and a small lump below, we might think about going through the head, whereas actually if most of it is low and there's a small bit above, we often think about coming from below and getting at it, as I say, transphenoidally or through the nose. But the newer technologies that are coming on board are actually changing that, that sort of perspective, and David has already touched on that a little bit um, for you. But the, but the newer technologies that are, that are coming on board for us are things called image guidance, where we have a much clearer idea of where the tumour is in 3D space in relation to our patient's head. And we know that because we put that into a computer system and it can tell us in real time where we, where we actually are. We have a pointer that tells us exactly where we are in relation to everything else on a scan undertaken prior to surgery. The interventional MRI unit we also use in this context really sometimes to be absolutely sure that we've taken out all that we can. And I suspect that Lewis will talk a little bit about that when he talks to you about brain gliomas and brain tumours. But for a lot of what we're operating on in pituitaries, we're almost operating around corners. So sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to know that you've really taken out all that you've set out to do. So the interventional MRI scan can be very useful. And David has already touched on the endoscopic techniques, but as I say, with endoscopes, you're not, you're, not always, you're not able to only look just straight ahead. You can have angled endoscopes that allow you to effectively look sideways. So you are almost able to look round corners. And that actually means that through a very small hole, i.e. your nostril, you can actually get a much bigger view of quite larger areas, and that allows you to see the anatomy much better. It allows you to therefore be reassured that you you know where you are, you can see the things that you're trying to protect, the things that you're trying to avoid, and therefore you're, we're actually expanding the, the indications in terms of the things that we're able to take out transphenoidally rather than through the head. So as I say, we're not just taking out um, small benign adenomas in the pituitary gland, we're taking out much larger abnormalities. And you can see that looking at the bottom pictures, I mean, it's, it's lovely getting, at, getting through somebody's nose and just taking out this tiny little abnormality. But when you're starting to talk about trying to take out these larger abnormalities, 
um, you really do need all, you know, all the information that you can have about you. And as I say, it, it, there is a real push in terms of trying to do things less invasively. Um, they're often perceived as smaller and therefore perhaps safer operations. One has to be a little bit careful about that. It's not, that's not always the case, and that's where your surgical decision-making comes into, into play. But people often have a much shorter length of stay. That's fundamentally better for, for patients. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, hospitals are not necessarily the best place to, place to be unless you absolutely have to be there. And there's a real push in terms of, you know, <laughs> patient preference. As I say, patients are very, are much more keen to, to have an operation up their nose, as I say, than having their head opened up. So th this is just an example of an interventional MRI. The, t the patient is, is lying on a table and this, t this table is able to swing round and the patient actually, whilst their head is still open, in the middle of an operation, whilst they're still asleep, we can, we can spin the table round and we can send the patient into the scanner, we get a scan and we bring them back out again and carry on almost as if nothing has happened. But that allows us an, a, a, a real-time image and obviously things have changed because by then we've already been operating for a length of time and things have changed and will have shifted we'll be able to check that we've taken out all that we wanted to do um, and as I say it does add time so it's not always necessarily useful but in specific situations it can help and this is one of our image guidance uh, systems so you can see if you look at if you look at this picture, we're coming at this, coming at this uh, pituitary fossa through the patient's nose. Historically, when you were looking at it just down with a, a microscope, you'd just really just have a straight trajectory. But actually, as I say, endoscopes will now let us look at different angles and will now open up a much larger area. So we're able to get at a lot, uh, a lot more pathologies, um, as I say, less invasively. Pituitary surgery at Queen Square, as I say, has, has got quite, a, quite a, a strong and long history. We do about 120 operations for, for benign tumours a, a year. Uh, we probably do about another 40 operations for other abnormalities in that area, and that represents about 15% of the national workload. Um, there are 30 neurosurgical units in the UK, so we do, we do more, than our, more than our fair share. So there's, there's been a historical build-up of expertise. I, I couldn't do what I do without the rest of the multidisciplinary team, and that's probably particularly and more so in, in the context of pituitary surgery than it is in, in other, in other subspecialty uh, areas, although we are all increasingly working as part of multidisciplinary teams. There's the neurosurgeons, there's the endocrinologists dealing with the hormones and the consequences of what I get up to up somebody's nose. There's the neuroradiologists... Uh, the radiotherapists and, and also our, our nurse specialist who provides the most fantastic service to, to our patients in terms of reassuring them and, and um, supporting them through surgery. There is a lot of evidence, particularly in pituitary surgery, to suggest that the more operations that you've done as a surgeon, the safer it is. So if you ever need an operation on your pituitary gland, go choose an experienced pituitary surgeon, preferably somebody who's done more than 500 op operations, because actually their risks of causing you any, any harm is significantly less than somebody who's done less than 200. Um, you can see that the death rate goes from 1% to 0.2. Um, the chances of making you worse off as far as your vision is significantly reduced. So as I say, it's, it's the one area in neurosurgery that there is very clear evidence about that and that's probably because it's relatively large volume consistent surgery that we do so as I say choose your pituitary surgeon well so on the back of that and on on the back of uh, just a general sense that um by forming larger units you increase expertise generally there's been an amalgamation of pituitary work since 2012 at Queen, from Queen Square as well as the Royal Free, as David has uh, already alluded to, and also Barts and the London, such that actually we deal with essentially all of the pituitary workload across, across North and uh, Central London. And the additional theatre capacity that we're talking about 
and the increased access to the newer technologies that I've talked about will allow a continued expansion of the unit with an increasing number of procedures and therefore expertise. And actually, the bottom line is that will make that safer for patients. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.